Welcome back to Feeling Seen, the podcast about the movies and characters that make us feel seen. My co-host today is a writer, director, filmmaker overall. We are howling at the moon for this one. It is Stephen C. Miller, everybody. And you might like more of his movies than you realize that you do. He is out here making them. Stephen's work includes films like the holiday slasher Silent Night, which I love, uh, Extraction, not the Chris Hemsworth one, a different one, Line of Duty, and Margot among many others actually and Margot sneaky good horror movie smart house horror movie highly recommend it um his new film is called werewolves uh people have responded to the trailer by saying it's the purge but with werewolves and it stars Frank Grillo so that really wraps its purginess up uh and it is an action-packed horror thriller starring you heard me Frank Grillo and Lou Diamond Phillips it is a roaring good time and it is in theaters right now We will put a link in our show notes for your viewing pleasure. Uh, But before you hop in the car and head to your local cinema to watch, Stephen and I are taking you back to 1985. Where we're going? We don't need roads. Here's our conversation with Stephen C. Miller. Stephen C. Miller, what else do the people need to know about you before we get started? Wow, that was a great intro. I don't know that they need anything more than that. That was fantastic. (laughs) Like, this is a lot of fun. No, I mean... You're right. I mean, I've been around doing some really fun things. I'm glad you mentioned Margot because it was a fun movie to make. It's so uh, fun. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, it, it was one of those movies that like they at the last second were like, OK, we're going to do Paramount Plus, which is fine. It's all good. But like you just don't know if it gets seen at that point because it's just on a streaming network that's just got so much so much content. Werewolves, December 6th. Uh, that one's going to be a party. So I'm excited for people to see that. Okay, you are coming off, I think, freshly off a screening the night before yes. we record. How are you feeling? How's the juice? How's the energy? It's flowing. You know, it's it's pretty amazing when you get into a packed theater. It was like 300 seats mm-hmm. packed out. Oh, that's so and cool. you have everyone just rowdy. Uh, like they were ready to watch the movie. And you got Frank Grillo there. And Grillo is also just having so much fun with the crowd. Um, he just knows how to pump people up. Um, but... You know, it, it's really cool during the movie when you're hearing the 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 gasps or the laughs or the the screams or the or just the cheering in the moments that you hoped you would get it. Uh, so it's definitely riding off of a high right now. Like I mean, I mean, I'm really excited about it. The fans definitely were into it. So I'm excited to see what normal people when they're going to watch the movie have to say. Um, but for the most part, I love seeing fans excited. I just love watching their reactions. So it's pretty fun. I was reading an interview, I think it might have been when you were doing Aggression Scale, when you were putting it out. It was an, an early, from about 10 years ago. And you were asked, like, by any means, if you had any means that you needed, what movie would you make right now? And you were like, I would make a werewolf bank heist movie. And here That's we right. are, like, 10 years later, that is, it's a werewolf, basically a werewolf contagion movie in werewolves. There is a, I think it's a, a year prior to the events of the movie, there is uh, an, an event where suddenly there is a mass turning of werewolves at the full moon. And so then we are in the story with Frank uh, at a time when it's like, all right, there is a precedence for this now. What are we going to do this time when millions of werewolves pop up across the landscape? And that that is the werewolf contagion movie of sorts that you ended up making 10 years from that comment. Why have werewolves been kicking around in there for so long? Were you always a werewolf movie guy? I've always been a werewolf movie guy ever, ever since like silver bullet got me when I was younger. Um, I think the thing was, is I came across like a, uh, a werewolf bank high script. And that's why I mentioned that because it was one that I loved and I tried to get that made for years and people just were not having werewolf movies. I mean, that's the stigma in LA anyway, and Hollywood in general is werewolf movies don't make money. Werewolf movies are too hard to make. Okay. So now is that like, obviously like trends, monsters, that kinds of things are cyclical. It's a vampire era here, but you werewolf movies, there's a resistance to them categorically sort of no matter the season. Absolutely. There is no season for werewolves. There, there just isn't. If you get one made, it's it's a dime a dozen. It is a unicorn. They just do not want to make them. Uh, producers don't. Well, especially when you're working in my space, which is, is a modestly low budget movies, is that like they, they really get scared about what the wolves are going to look like. 
how bad is it going to be? Right. Is the, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, those are the first things that people say, well, no, it's just going to look bad. Right. You can't get, you don't have the money to make it look right. And then when you get to the studio level, it's not even about the money. It's about, no, people just won't show up. It, it's a constant fight. And, and I was lucky enough that when I found werewolves, this script that it had, I think the action is what allowed people to go, okay, maybe you can do this. It's not the slow burn one werewolf trying to take in a house there was some resistance, but I, there was something about this and with the producers that I had just come off of doing a movie called Line of Duty with that, you know, the movie made them enough money that they were like, look, we'll take a chance. Yeah, the, you know, I got lucky. The producers, they were like, yeah, let's do it. You, you gave us a great, you gave us a banger. So we'll we'll do it for you. And I was like, all right. So we uh, we went out to Puerto Rico and we shot in the summer, which is a mistake, but we Ooh. did it. <laughs> hot, hot. hot in these Ooh. suits is like bananas um but uh yeah man we just had so much fun it, it was cool and, and it's it was it was one of those movies that you knew when you're making it okay this is working that's nice that's really nice it's not always like that you know you're sometimes you're in there and you're like oh god what am i what am i doing but uh when you're feeling it and when the the lead actor frank grillo's feeling it you kind of you kind of get some hope You've worked across many genres, and you ha- you've made all kinds of movies. And the movie that you have brought for us today is a melting pot of uh, a movie and character is a melting pot of of some fun science fiction and action and adventure and sort of like teen adventure, teen coming of age, comedy, romance. Um, tell us what you have brought for us to discuss today: an ultimate touch point of cinema. Yeah, I don't know that it's surprising if people really know me. It's Back to the Future. It's Back to the Future. Uh, it, it is one of my favorite movies of all time, probably because it's one of my earliest memories seeing a movie that big um, and uh, and always being a staple in my from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray collection. Um, but it was just a movie that I remember watching and falling in love with immediately because it just felt so like, oh, man, I maybe I could build a time machine. Maybe I could do that. Come here. I'll show you how it works. First, you turn the time circuits on. (laughs) This readout tells you where you're going. This one tells you where you are. This one tells you where you were. You input your destination time on this keypad. Say you want to see the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Or witness the birth of Christ. There's just something about it to me that it now is nostalgic, but even watching it then just really rang true for me as like a really fun movie that you want to go see classic popcorn, uh, enjoy yourself kind of movie. And what was it about Marty? What was it about Marty McFly? I think Marty McFly, the, the reason the guy got me is because he's kind of a big dork. Like it, he wants to be cool. You know, he thinks he's cool. Uh, but in reality, he's constantly in trouble. He's constantly late. He's fumbling around through the adventure. Am I to understand you're still hanging around with Dr. Emmett Brown McFly? Party slip for you, Miss Parker. And one for you, McFly. I believe that makes four in a row. Now, let me give you nickels worth of free advice, young man. The so-called Dr. Brown is dangerous. He's a real nutcase. If you hang around with him, you're going to end up in big trouble. Oh, yes, sir. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker, too. For Christ's sakes, the guy's best friend is a 65-year-old nuclear (laughs) physicist. (laughs) Disgraced physicist. He's not the most popular guy in the cafeteria. There is no way this guy is the most popular guy in the cafeteria. And and his band sucked, right? We're the uh, the pinheads. <laughs> and so I just remember I just remember watching it for the first time going, oh, my God, this guy, this guy gets me um, because that's sort of how I felt. I felt like maybe I was cool, but skating at the time wasn't cool, uh, you know, and uh, being in any band wasn't cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it was really one of those things that I resonated with 
pretty heavily that I felt like, well, I'm trying to be cool, but I'm clearly not. And this guy was able to make an adventure out of it. Uh, so how can I do that? And, and that was that was really something that I loved about it. What do you think it is? Obviously, like the, the performance by Michael J. Fox, like it's one of those things where it's like it couldn't have been anybody but him sort of thing. What was it about him, his performance, what Robert Zemeckis had was crafting here for the screen and the era that it arrived? Why was he so emblematic of this leading figure in in that moment in time that was such an incredible conduit for people to attach on to, you think? You know, I think it's interesting because I actually think now we were able to see what the contrast is with Stoltz, who originally was Marty McFly, right? right? So the audience, the audience actually got to see clips of how Stoltz was and how they were like, this isn't working. And then the difference when they brought in Michael J. Fox and how Michael J. Fox's presence and persona, there was just something about him at that time. I mean, he was doing uh, the show at that time. He was doing, I mean, I think he'd already shot um, a Teen Wolf. It hadn't come out yet, but mm, his presence. That was a huge one in my house. Teen Wolf was huge in my house. Teen Wolf is huge, right? It is definitely a big one for my kids. They love that movie. Um, so he his presence at that time was pretty gigantic. And I feel like he was just in the right moment at the right time. And he felt so relatable. I think that's the key for these kind of movies. And that's why these movies work like the Goonies and those movies at that time just worked, right? Because all of these kids or teenagers, they felt so relatable. Uh, we were sitting there going, yeah, we have that room. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm i trying to play the guitar. I know that guy. Um, and I feel like to me, that makes a lot of sense. And that's something Robert Zemeckis was brilliant at uh, when coming up with this movie and making it a teenager because he could have done it with, you know, any age character, but doing it with a teenager, knowing it could connect with that audience, it's brilliant. I mean, the guy understood what the zeitgeist moment was. He understood that this character, even though, like we said, he's friends with a really old gentleman, which is kind of weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mentors in unlikely places. Yeah, it's just one of those things is like, I guess this is fine. I mean, we'll, sure, we'll buy it. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of the movie, because you do buy it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Besides, the stainless steel construction made the flux dispersal. Look out! In the 80s, everybody's like, yeah, sure. Yeah, like that. that's fine. We'll just go with it because the characters work and you fall in love with the character right away. I mean, the guy's late to everything. He's never on time. He's the worst. <laughs> and then, then, and uh, and somehow you still fall in love with him. It's just all relatability. You know, I was looking at the filmography. I mean, God, Robert Zemeckis has made so many movies and he's made so many different kinds of movies. And he has been he is clearly someone who is skewed toward wanting to push form and innovate his whole career. His newest movie is here. The one that takes place in a fixed position on planet Earth over from the dawn of time to through the life of like one family that it focuses on with Tom Hanks and Robert Wright and Robin Wright. And um you have made so many different kinds of movies as well. And I wondered, like, is there, is the push and pull of, in the does the industry want a filmmaker to be sort of one kind of thing? Or, like, does you doing a variety of, do you feel like you have been pulled toward wanting to do one kind of thing and have wanted to experiment in other directions? Or is that kind of freedom of movement welcome now in the eras where you have come up since you started, I think, making features in the 2000s? Yeah, yeah. I think at first when I got here, it was like, no, you're the horror guy. You you have to stay, you have to stay in the horror genre, right? And then, so everything I was up for in my first two or three years out here was like, Every remake you can imagine. There was every horror movie you can imagine. <laughs> In those years, I am yeah, sure from it 2007 was. to 2009, like it was like The Crow, it was Children of the Corn, it was Last House on the Left. You know, it was everything, right? Um, and so, yeah, it was definitely like you know you need to stick to your guns and and that kind of a thing. But over the course of that time, and and I think as indie filmmaking got more, um, not better, but got more. Um, I guess with phones coming out and being able to shoot things and, and ch cameras getting cheaper. So everything being more accessible, movies started shifting and filmmakers started shifting and sort of jumping into different genres constantly. Um, and I think that sort of opened up the world for people to say, okay, I think it's okay. And also maybe streaming did too, because people needed content. 
So it wasn't like they were like, you have to be here. Well, if you can do this too, we do need content. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so that was where I got lucky because then they were just, you know, it was like I had been pushing for action. Um, and, and really most of my movies before my action genre decade was, was really horror movies disguised with action it was an action movie disguised as horror really is what they were um and so i've been thinking a lot about dog, dog soldiers, soldiers the watching the rollout of werewolves and That's thinking like is. this has got to be something he's he's on dog soldiers with. is one of my favorite favorite werewolf movies and 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 neil marshall in general as a director i mean the descent um i remember sitting in a theater and the descent just being like what the fuck is this movie this movie is insane uh, it, unbelievable. unbelievable and funny funny story about the descent is i it was like my first year or so here in la and i went to a, a screening at the man's chinese and i sat down and it was just me in the theater because it was a late screening a couple weeks in and there's nobody there and it's just me uh and i'm sitting in the middle and this dude sits right next to me and i'm like <laughs> bro that. bro this is this a whole theater but it wasn't just some dude it was quentin tarantino and quentin oh sat there God. next to me and watched dog soldiers and was hitting me the whole movie like so like like he just showed up and watched a movie next to me so wild we had a lot we had a fun time but i will say i didn't even it wasn't like a conversation it was just like acknowledge that he's next to me okay we're gonna watch dog soldiers together and then All acknowledge right. it was good that was it part ways but that's my fun la sort of weird story yeah so we uh you know it's one of those movies that i love and i feel like it seeped into werewolves all over the place but that's what really allowed me to jump genres is those kind of things and then once action hit i was really just kind of focusing on really like an action boot camp uh really is what i was focusing on because you know i had said no to quite a bit of things in my earlier career which left me not making movies um, that by the time I got to my action decade, I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to say yes to fucking everything. I'm just going to make movies and I'm just going to make everything I can try to make it as cool as possible. Plus I'm getting to work with guys that I grew up watching. Like it doesn't get any yes, better. Like there was like a two year run where you made like four or five. Yeah, movies. it was wild. Like it was like back to back to back to back. And it was with guys like Bruce Willis, Nick Cage, Sloan. I mean, these guys are just like heavy hitters. Right. And you're just like, man. I'm going to be on set with these guys. No complaints. I'm just going to, I'm going to make them look cool, uh, shoot some cool action. And eventually, you know, one of these is going to pop. Um, and so, you know, that's what I did. And that, that was what was fun about that, that decade. And I think, you know, answering your question, I think then it allows filmmakers to just keep kind of jumping back and forth. But for me, what it did was go, okay, I'm good at action. I'm good at, or I want to get back to something that combines the both of them. Uh, and that's what I love about werewolves. And, you know, for, I don't know that I'm, I think I also figured out with something like Margot that I love Margot, but I don't know if I'm like the greatest slow burn guy, you know what I mean? Like, like, and I, you know, you start to figure things out about yourself or you're like, you know, I love it, but am I the slow burn guy or am I the guy that needs to just be punching people in the teeth the whole time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I suspect if I was a director, I would be a punch. Yeah, people yeah in the it is director. a fun, it's a fun thing to be. And now when you were, when you were, when you were first starting out and like making movies, perhaps like with friends and stuff, like what was the kind of stuff you were shooting just like as a young kid, as a young guy starting out and just finding, the, finding the voice, finding the tech. We were shooting a lot of wrestling. Um, like I was, not no <laughs> yeah. joke. Like I had my brother like jumping off the roof. I think we did like some kind of suplexes off the roof on the mattresses on the ground. And I was shooting that. I had them jumping <laughs> out of windows. It felt like parkour before parkour was like really fucking yeah. cool. No, it was a lot of that it was a lot of action, a lot of just running around. And like I said, I grew up in sort of the skate community and and, and underground band community. Um, and so I was doing a lot of that stuff, too. So I was always felt like I was running around with a camera. Um, and I and I kind of learned very early on that being kinetic was something that I was good at. Um, and so kinetic is sort of like runs in the veins of my movies. Um, and so that that was early on was really always about like how can i shoot something fast cool fun and me and my brothers were watching movies like bad boys like bad boys was our jam like we we were just always like you know we can make i i think i've told this story before like in film school i remember the first day it was like everybody was like you know what do you want to make and the teacher's asking and people are like you know i want to make a uh, requiem for a dream or i want to make uh, my own private idaho or whatever the rts movie is which is are all fucking great movies uh and then it got to me and i was like you know, i just want to make bad boys and you hear the whole crowd oh god you know, and like, what yeah. did I say? What's wrong? You know, like, and you get the groans from the film school guys. But you know what I'm saying? That's the thing. But I've always been that guy. I knew popcorn movies were my jam. I knew 
those kind of movies were, were fun for me. And so, you know, I've always leaned into that. I've never been scared of that. Um, I've never been one to sort of shy away with what I do uh, because I feel like, you know, if you, if you just enjoy it, then the audience will enjoy it and you're going to, you're going to get those fans. So that's, that's something that I just got to focus on. The, the, the catalyst in my mind for this question is like the crisis of masculinity. Uh-huh. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of drawing, I'm connecting that in my mind right now to kind of the, um, the sort of conversation that was more more prevalent like uh, maybe a couple years ago that was like you know where are all the male movie stars like where there's timothy chalamet and there's a kind of ever presence about him and then it can kind of feel like there's a sort of revolving door of these like sensation level figures in the way that it feels like there are more female celebrity figures that like like a zendaya a billy eilish uh people who women who can sort of cement this place and ride at this level of stardom that imparts a sort of iconography to them that can feel like a road map to I remember sitting in a Starbucks in like Studio City um, a number of years ago and there it was the after school crowd had come in and which is like my favorite time of day in a Starbucks when it just floods with 13 year olds who are they're getting their drinks that are as big as they are and there was this trio of, of girls who was who were clearly all in the industry in some capacity like they were you know young child actors and I was asking them like who do you guys look up to? Like, who do you, you know, what kind of figures? And they were like, you know, Chloe Grace Moretz is just so inspirational. And they thought Selena Gomez was just it. And I feel like in the 1980s, we were not lacking for, for like boy adventurers. And it's not like there are not like enough men and boys on screen. Fine. But like you touched, you had a touch point in Marty McFly. And who were the sort of like, who are the aspirational stars that you was like a young guy growing up watching movies where you were like, that guy's fucking cool. Like, I want to be that guy when I grow up. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, what's funny is I I, I thought fucking Bruce Campbell was fucking cool. When I just thought he yeah. was awesome uh, from Evil Dead. He was the guy. But but a classic guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger was was the jam. I mean, Terminator was like a movie for me that was uh inspirational it, it hit hard i remember watching that movie for the first time being like what is this like who makes this this is so cool when you watch it like you watch it the, that movie is a slasher that movie is a walk-in stock it, it totally slasher is. and then t2 is a bona fide like action but that movie's a slasher it's a slasher horror movie i mean james cameron came from robert Cor- from roger corman you know i mean so it's like when you're dealing mm-hmm. with a guy who's dealt with roger corman his whole career and helped him and and made these movies i mean he made piranha at one point like so like you know i i think that's sort of the that for me was always the uh the the go-to james cameron was a go-to of a guy who i looked at who could make very early movies that felt like horror slasher movies and then the next thing you know he's making terminator 2 and on to being you know the the man um but you know i those are those are some of the guys that i thought for me when i was growing up were just so fucking cool probably bill paxton i thought bill paxton was so cool you know like he's he was just one of those guys who would show up. I could see why you're a successful man. You've had a you put you attached yourself to some phenomenal role models. <laughs> I just they're just some cool guys like who don't don't and they just weren't the guys that had to be the biggest guys on the block. Uh, and so yeah. uh, I always found that really cool. It's the same with Nick Cage. Like these guys when they got into these action roles, they weren't. It's they sort of like when we started phasing out the big guys and bringing in like the smaller guys. They're kind of smart, but they can be action guys too, right? And like. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. But from early on, even in his John Hughes movies from, you know, like doing that, I mean, he was in the original Terminator, right? He was like a little punk guy in Terminator and he was the crazy cousin in a weird science or brother in weird science, um, you know, Chet, right? <laughs> Chet, Chip, Chip, Chet. Chip or Chet. Yeah, I just thought he was <laughs> whack, you know, I was like, this guy is crazy. Um, and so, and then, you know, he just shows up in these movies, you know, he's baller. So yeah, I think he's probably a good, a good one for me because I always remember when I would see him, I'd be like, God, he's so cool. Great Scott. We will be right back with Stephen C. Miller with more from Back to the Future. And then I will have one quick thing before I go, and this is going to sound random, but it's about Betty Gilpin. Uh, because she's taking over the role, the titular role, in the uh, Broadway smash Oh Mary created by Cola Scola. And I just want to talk about Betty Gilpin because it's my show and she deserves to be talked about. So stick around at the end. Hello. 
Hey, is is this Meredith? It is. This is Alex Schmidt from Secretly Incredibly Fascinating. I'm calling because you have been named the Maximum Fun Member of the Month for the month of December. Hooray! Yeah. As the member of the month, you are going to get a $25 gift card to the Maximum Fun store. You get a special member of the month bumper sticker, and you get to use a special parking spot at the Maximum Fun headquarters in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Definitely getting plenty of return on my investment. I have not worked through all the bonus content yet. <laughs> If you're a Max Fund member, you can become the next Max Fund member of the month. Support us at MaximumFun.org slash join. Hello, teachers and faculty. This is Janet Varney. I'm here to remind you that listening to my podcast, The JV Club with Janet Varney, is part of the curriculum for the school year. Learning about the teenage years of such guests as Alison Brie, Vicki Peterson, John Hodgman, and so many more is a valuable and enriching experience. One you have no choice but to embrace, because yes, listening is mandatory. The JV Club with Janet Varney is available every Thursday on Maximum Fun or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. And remember, no running in the halls. I wanted to hear from you about sort of growing up at a time where movies like the slate of things that Robert Zemeckis put together, like all three of the Back to the Futures, obviously, but I think one of my favorite Zemeckis movies is what, like, What Lies Beneath? Like, and what did having, like, what did growing up in an era of Back to the Future imbue into you as somebody who would go on to do this yourself in terms of, like, what the possibility was of what you could do as a as somebody who made this stuff yourself. Yeah, I think it's just an early love of movies. It, it really made you love movies. And I think that is just rare. <laughs> and I think we grew up in an era where it's so cool because the movies were, they were making movies they could not make now, number one. They just couldn't make them because the movies uh, deal with a lot of weird things. And there's so many different aspects of the movies that they take time to get to know characters. They take time to develop characters. Um, and I think for me that what he was doing and what those movies did for me is create a real love for movies so that when I moved into filmmaking, I kind of I, I really came at it from a love of movies and not like a technical standpoint of how to make the movie or like the uh, or the the textbook, you know, it has to be shot this way or done this way or the theory of a movie. Uh, I really came at it from loving movies and really going, OK, I love these movies. How do I do those movies? Um, you know what I mean? And like and I and I'm, I'm not shy to say that there's plenty of times when we're on set and my film language in general when I'm making movies is like, dude, I love this shot from Alien. Remember that shot? Let's do that shot. You know what I mean? And everybody's like, oh, yeah, we know that shot. Let's do that shot. Uh, and so I I have no shame in saying that, like, you know, there's I, I watch movies to go. Oh, I love that. I'm I'm stealing that. Um, and I and try to make it my own because I feel like that for me is what it, it gets me up in the morning. It was excites me about is just movies and loving movies. And I think that was ingrained into me really early from these films because they felt like they were being made by a guy who loved movies. Um, and Robert Zemeckis, to me, felt like a guy who had grinded. Uh, we all know the story. Back to the Future got rejected for years. For years, yeah. it got rejected. Um, and so the guy had to go on and, and sort of build a career before he could make Back to the Future. And so I think for me, that was something that I always looked up to uh, as a filmmaker, um, as someone that can persevere and, and make it and keep pushing and then push the boundaries like and get into something like What Lies Beneath, which Harrison Ford in a horror movie is like, like unreal oh, you know yeah. what i mean like who no, nobody would have thought at that time yeah. you could get the biggest movie star on the planet uh to be in a horror film right and and uh and really i'm sure i don't even remember it being sold as a horror film as much as a thriller but when you watch it it's a horror film it's like straight up horror absolutely film. Yeah, oh, it's so I love that good movie. it everyone in it is fantastic <clears throat> and zemeckis directs the shit out of it so yeah it, and that's something that you just look at and you go man the guy can go from family fun comedy to action to Forrest Gump to, you know, oh, wait, now he's making a horror movie with what lies beneath. So it's one of those guys who could bend it how he wants to bend it. Um, and then, he, you know, he does uh, he does all these crazy like animation movies 
that he did also really fucking cool and my kids love that and so um yeah it's been it's actually been really cool to show my kids these movies because you rewatch and experience it very differently um and so that for me has been a lot of fun the past couple of years that's the thing i've been thinking a lot about lately that has come up on the show a few times which is the like watching movies over years and then finding how you relate to them differently over time and perhaps even relating to different characters over time and being like oh wow um, I'm not, not I'm not necessarily Marty McFly anymore. Right. That's crazy. Yeah, it does feel like that. And, and and what's funny is like, you know, I, I can sort of almost relate with the Marty McFly of the future at sometimes. You know what I mean? Where you're like, oh right, now I'm that guy who has to be at work, who's dealing with emails, and my kids are running around. You know, like so. It is funny because that movie sort of transcends uh, a little bit of generations because it's going to the future, uh, which is pretty cool. And yeah, it, it's one of those movies where I remember we watched it, rewatched it with my kids for the first time. Uh, and they watched it for the first time a few years ago now. But I mean, my son's eyes lit up. My daughter's eyes lit up. They I mean, my son went as Marty McFly for for Halloween that year. You know what I mean? Like, you just you just don't know that these movies still have that kind of an impact on kids because, you know, I mean, because they're so involved with other things. It's just there's so much out there that they could look at um, that when you actually get them to sit down and watch something, you're nervous. You're like, oh, my God, I love this movie. Please love this movie. <laughs> and, and, and so when they do, it works. You're like, yes, they love it. I have been, I cannot talk about Back to the Future without, no matter how many times I've watched this movie at how many different points in my life, I am never any less overwhelmed at the, what I consider to be the most like uncomfortably, catastrophically horny performance ever committed to cinema with Leah Thompson's Absolutely. Lorraine. I watch this and I'm like, this is Still in a post Twilight world where we redefined horny longing through Bella Swan for Edward. Like I watched that and I'm like this, like I, I need to look away. This is so thirsty. I still need to look away. I'm in my twenties. <laughs> I'm in my thirties. It's the 2020s. And there is still something about the performance that Leah Thompson that is giving that is so embodied in her desperation for Marty I, I, I don't, like, even in a euphoria world, I think that that is still t almost too intense to watch at times. But it's for her son. That's even more crazy. It's for like, her again, son. It's for her like, son. how did that pitch go? Right. How did Zemeckis pitch this to the studio? This is the movie. My guy, he's he's young guy. He's a teenager and he's best friends with a nuclear physicist. Oh, is he your age? No, he's 40 or 50. We don't know. And and, yeah. and, then, and then it's like, oh, and by the way, we're going to go back in time and the mom's going to fall in love with him. What do you mean the mom's going to fall in love? <laughs> you know, how does that bitch go? And yeah, gonna and she's going to sit on his bed and talk about his underwear and proposition him. You're my mom. You're my mom. My name is Lorraine. Lorraine Bates? Yeah. But you're, uh, you're so, uh, you're so... Thin. Just relax, Calvin. You've got a big bruise on your head. Ah. Where are my pants? Over there. On my hope chest. I've never seen purple underwear before, Calvin. Calvin, why, why do you keep calling me Calvin? Well, that is your name, isn't it? Calvin Klein? It's written all over your underwear. Ah. Oh, I guess they call you Cal. Huh? No, actually, people call me Marty. Oh, pleased to meet you, Calvin. Marty. Clyde. While he's in his undies, right? Like, that is cringe. But it's like, you're like, oh, my God. Like, at the time, I just, it's like funny. You don't process it like that. And when you're watching it, like... I didn't process it until I'm much older when I was like, wait a minute. This is strange. No! <laughs> yeah. This is <laughs> super, super weird. weird. And you like, you see how like you like, and Michael J. Fox, oh. Michael J. Fox plays it with a kind yes. of like upsetting desperation and like terror. Yes. That once you do hit that threshold where you really process what you're seeing, you're like, wow, Michael J. Fox nailed this performance because it is exactly this bad he should be sweating and freaking out and horrified at what's going on i couldn't even imagine being on set on that day and him having to get into that character and really understanding the weight of it um and and you're right like when you really watch his performance between that scene and the scene when they're in the car 
And at the end of the move, towards the end of the movie, when she's trying to, she does kiss him. And he's like, I'm kissing my brother. You're like, oh my God. Marty, why are you so nervous? Rain, have you ever uh, been in a situation where you knew you had to act a certain way, but when you got there, you didn't know if you could go through with it? Oh, you mean like how you're supposed to act on a first date? Oh, uh, sort of. Well, I, th I think I know exactly what you mean. You, you, you do? You know what I do in those situations? What? I don't worry. This is all wrong. I, I don't know what it is. But when I kiss you, it's like I'm kissing my brother. I guess that doesn't make any sense, does it? Believe me, it makes perfect sense. His reaction in that whole scene, too, is also just like every guy now's reaction to their mom trying to kiss them. You would be like, what? Right? And, and he's so phenomenal. Uh, you know, he was just such a phenomenal actor like that, that he was able to take that. And it's all facial expression, right? He didn't need to say anything. He didn't need to say a word. You just knew with with the Fox's like facial expressions, his eyebrows and face that you got it. And, and those are the best actors, because sometimes the dialogue, it, it's not even and what's what I love about movies, right? Cinema is so visual, right? So like, you don't need dialogue sometimes to get across some of the greatest performances of all time. And that is one of them where you're just like, man, the guy's got to try to avoid his mom trying to get on him. And she's, and she, she's yeah. so fucking thirsty for this dude. And you're just like, Oh mom, like stop, you know, like can't even take it. I mean, you know, and then they take it to the next level when Biff comes in there and you're just like, Oh my God, now the dad's oh, got to come God. beat him up. That's so wild stuff. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, well, I wanted to like, you know, with like you said, there's the void of sort of streaming that like, thank God for distribution models, get movies out there. Talk about like being, you know, a working filmmaker for so long. Tell me about the power of having your movie in a theater. Oh, man, I don't that's it's surreal. I got to be honest with you. It's absolutely surreal because yeah. you do this for a long time. And your goal from the very beginning when you're making movies, at least for me, from the very beginning is theatrical. From the very beginning is how do I get my movie to yeah. see? How does my my parents in Florida or my cousins in New York? York, how do they see the movie? Right. Because they, I, of course you want them to see it on the big screen. So for years you're working for that and you get these movies in my action decade where, yeah, they got like a 20 or 30 city screen release, which is like nothing, right? The major city, no one's picking that up. So when this one came and they're like, Hey, we're going to put it everywhere. It was a, it was a moment. I think I probably cried a couple of times to be quite honest with you, where you're just like for real, like it's going to get that kind of push um and yeah and, and it's been amazing to see people actually res respond to that and and really it sort of affects them like yeah we're ready to see this in a theater so it's all emotional um and i think that for me is a good thing um i really enjoy sort of leaning into that emotion and 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 sort of take that with a hey this could only this might only happen once which is fine and i'll fucking enjoy it um and love it uh and so that's where i'm at that's the mode i'm in i'm in just enjoy it love it um people are gonna say what they're gonna say they're either gonna love it they're gonna hate it i'm not they don't care um you know i just want you to go to see it so yeah it is one of those things to get to see it and like i said seeing it at a theater last night with an audience um that was really hungry for it um and had such a great time for me was on another level so i'm really excited for people to actually get out there actually see it with randos in a theater um and see how they enjoy it and now you say you, you've mentioned your action decade. I guess my concluding question will be, do you feel your sort of incoming decade, such as it is, do you feel compelled? Do you taking everything that you've done so far? What is there a sort of um, defining ethos that you've defining track or sort of genre that you feel yourself drawn toward or is now a time when after amassing all the tools that you have as a filmmaker and an, and an industry creature, like as a, someone having to wade through the business of this for so long, what is it that feels most exciting to you, perhaps as a challenge, perhaps as a comfort place uh, after after an action decade such as you have had? 
I, I think moving into the more genre space, I'm excited to get back to and be a big part of because I feel like the genre movies are really coming back. It almost feels like the late 90s, early 2000s of Dark Castle movies, right? Like, what, what? What a, de- oh what a time. And I feel like time. that is sort of like people are like, how do we get back there? And if I could lead the charge of that or be involved in the charge of that and just really bringing back these movies that are, you know, at a decent budget level um, that don't need to be out of control, um, but still look great, get the audience going. Um, that to me is what I, I would love to do. I'd love to be creating things genre wise with monsters, with uh, horror uh, and, and mixing that with action. That to me, it would be my happy place for right mm-hmm. now. Well, that is like that. That's my, I've, I've spent all our time. Oh man, that's great. I, I'm so, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited that you came on. I'm so excited. Werewolves is in theaters. Congratulations on that. That is extremely cool. Thank you so much for having me. So much fun. And yeah, I hope everyone gets out and sees it. It's it's a lot of fun. Thank you again to Stephen C. Miller for their time and for taking us back with a classic. Uh, we've been hitting some real 80s touch points lately, guys. Nods to you, Gen X. You've really got it for us. Um, Stephen's film, Werewolves, is in theaters right now. And you can find tickets at werewolvesmovie.com. Support a guy out there making movies, getting it done. Uh, support. This is a support independent cinema kind of pitch. This is a glossier, shinier movie uh, than ones in his prior filmography for the most part. Do not sleep on Silent Night. Some of Donald Logue's best work, I'm telling you. Uh, but yeah, get out there and support a guy who's just working for the love of the game. Uh, and now that one quick thing before I go... Like I said, it's Betty Gilpin, gang. I just want to talk about Betty Gilpin uh, because I'm always thinking about where, what, where is, not in like a personal way, where is Betty Gilpin, but in like a career way, where is Betty Gilpin? Why is she not, why do I not have a Betty Gilpin a casting announcement like twice a month about something new that she's doing? Um, whether you know her from, um, I mean, let's just stick with the big ones, you know, whether you know her from Glow and her fantastic work there, whether you know her from Mrs. Davis, the Peacock show where she plays a nun who is endeavoring to take down a Siri-like artificial intelligence figure that is running our entire world, or whether you know her from The Hunt. Listen, the controversy surrounding The Hunt was a whole lot of nothing. I find that movie highly entertaining, but it has no teeth whatsoever. Um, it, it it did not merit an, a, an ounce of the controversy that it ginned up as being like some sort of transgressive film or whatever. But who cares? It is fun. It has got Hilary Swank playing uh, an entitled rich woman to the absolute teeth. And it has got Betty Gilpin in one of the most unexpected performances I think that's ever happened I I spoke to the director about that movie when it came out and I asked him I was like how much okay like Betty's performance like there's so much happening that just feels like it defies someone telling her like hey I think you should do this it feels so spontaneous and so un- like surprising you you put the camera on her and you let her go <laughs> like you can't you can't coach what she has she's too good she's too odd she's too interesting um I think she's one of the just like low key most dynamic actors we have working out there today and she's put out like a book of essays and she keeps a really low profile. I, she's doing her own thing, man. And just being really good at her job whenever she pops up and where she's going to pop up next, I think is her Broadway debut. She is assuming the titular role of Mary Todd Lincoln in the hit Broadway show, Oh Mary, which was created by Cola Scola. Cola Scola has been starring in the show as Mary Todd Lincoln um, for the run of it up until early next year when Betty Gilpin will take the reins. And as much as I am sad, I 
I don't think I'll get to see Cola Scola be Mary Todd Lincoln, which is what a what a pleasure for all those who have. I like I will plan a trip to New York to see Betty Gilman, knowing that like I really want to see the show because of everything I've heard about it. And now it's like it's Betty. It's like Jordan. How many more times are you gonna choose against happiness um, by not seeing Oh Mary in some iteration? And how could you? How could you know peace if you didn't see it with Betty Gilpin when, the, when you had the chance? Letting Cola Scola and Betty Gilpin get away from you as Mary Todd Lincoln? How could you do that? As she said, um, she is so happy to be taking over the role and it leaves time and space for Cole to get back to their true passions of fracking and skincare. So we wish Cola Scola uh, recently a star in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade on the back of a flamingo. We wish them all the best queer comedy icon, Cola Scola. Uh, and that's it. That's that's the show. God, why don't I just close once every couple of months? Once every month with Betty Gilpin musing upon her. Um, yes, that is our show. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Pod, or send us an email at feelingscene@maximumfun.org. If you want to follow me, I am Jor Crew on Twitter and Blue Sky. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. This show is produced by Danielle Huesius. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Loris Wisher, and this is a production of Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows, supported directly by you.